Hi, I'm Jessica. Today we're going to work on inferring meaning from context and part of speech. So if you read something and you don't understand what you're reading or there's a word that you don't know, you can use the context and also the words part of speech to help you guess what it means. Today I'm going to teach you about the eight parts of speech and we're going to do some practice. So when you're trying to find out the right meaning of an unknown word, look at the part of speech. If you're like, Jessica, what's part of speech? Don't worry, we're going to go over it right now. So there are eight parts of speech. Do you know them? So they are noun, pronoun, adjective, verb, adverb, preposition, conjunction, and interjection. You might think articles like a, an, the are a part of speech, but actually articles are not. Okay, let's go over each one of these. So noun is a part of speech. Do you know what's a noun? If you said person, place, or thing, you're correct. So for example, Dr. Lee, Sophia, teacher, son, UCLA, Disneyland, school, pencil, apple, dog, and coffee are all nouns. We have two types of nouns. They're called proper nouns and then common nouns. Proper nouns are particular people, places, or things, and proper nouns are capitalized. So you can think of it as a specific person. So for example, Dr. Lee is a specific person. Sophia is a proper noun. It's a specific woman or girl, and that's why also her name is capitalized. UCLA is not just any school or any university. It's a specific university, University of California, Los Angeles. So that would be a proper noun as well. Disneyland and Apple are also proper nouns. Apple with a capital A would be the company and not the fruit. So any companies or businesses, their names would be proper nouns. The other type of noun is a common noun. Common nouns are just general people, places, or things. So for example, in the list above, all the lowercase ones like teacher, son, school, pencil, dog, and coffee, they're all common nouns. They are just general, not a specific teacher, not a specific dog, not a specific school, just general. So we have proper nouns and common nouns. The next part of speech is a pronoun. So if you see pronoun, it has the word noun in it. This helps you remember it relates to a noun. A pronoun replaces a noun. For example, Sophia is going for a walk. She takes her dog out. Who is she? Yes. She is Sophia. So if you see, in the first sentence we said Sophia. The second sentence we already know who you're talking about. So instead of saying Sophia takes her dog out, you can just delete Sophia and replace it with she. She is a pronoun. There are many different types of pronouns. Subject pronouns include I, you, we, they, he, she, it. You can think of subject pronouns come before the verb. So, she leaves the house. Leaves is the verb. Coming before the verb is she. She is the subject. So, you can think subject, verb. Another type of pronoun is an object pronoun. These come after the verb. So, me, you, us, them, him, her, it. For example, Al pulls her down the street. So, in this sentence, pulls is the verb. And remember, objects come after the verb. So if you see pulls her, her is the object pronoun. You also have possessive pronouns. So if you think about I is the subject, me is the object, then for that, for possessive would be my. So my, your, our, their, his, her, its. Sophia runs with her dog. So if you see her comes before the noun dog, it's possessive. Something that's possessive you can think of is their possession or belongs to him or her. So her dog, that's Sophia's dog. The next part of speech is an adjective. Adjectives describe a noun or a pronoun or give more information about it. These are some example adjectives. Smart, pretty, boring, exciting, big, new, blue. Blue's a color, all of your colors are adjectives. Some example sentences are, Jennifer is smart, her big blue glasses are unique. So if you see in the last sentence, big, 
blue, and unique are all adjectives. Verb is the next part of speech. Verb is an action word, but we do have some non-action verbs like be, have, and think. A verb shows what the noun or pronoun does. So for example, eat, run, talk, write, go, cough, laugh, has or have. So all of them except has or have are action words. You can think of the body moving and you're doing some type of action. Has or have will be a non-action word. An example sentence would be, Jennifer is smart and she reads a lot. Is your be verb and reads are both verbs. Adverb. So if you look in the word how it has verb, this helps you know it relates to verbs. Adverbs describe a verb, adjective, or another adverb. This shows you how the verb acts, or you can think of it like how things are done. Some example adverbs are quietly, badly, well, fast, quickly, carefully. If you notice, a lot of our adverbs end in ly, but not all of them, because we don't say fastly. So fast is an adverb, quickly has the ly. Well also doesn't have the ly. Jennifer reads quietly. Quietly is the adverb. So you can ask yourself, how does she read? Quietly. So remember, adverbs tell you how things are done. If I say, she sings beautifully, how does she sing? Beautifully. There are many different types of adverbs, like adverbs of time, now, daily, and adverbs of frequency, such as always, usually, never. Another part of speech is preposition. Prepositions are words that show the relationship between a noun or a pronoun and some other word in the sentence. For example, at, in, on, under, of, behind, between, or with. These are all prepositions. Some example sentences. There are a lot of toys on the floor. Katie is in the store. Conjunction is another part of speech. A conjunction joins words, ideas, or sentences together. And, but, or, so, because, until, although are all conjunctions. Let me give you an example sentence. Nywin likes pop and rap music, but he doesn't like classical music. And and but are both conjunctions. Interjection is the last part of speech which you may not have heard of. It's actually, in my opinion, not very useful, but it is still good to know that it is one of the parts of speech. So an interjection expresses surprise or strong emotion. It is a short exclamation. This is just normally one word. So for example, hey, ouch, oh, wow, phew. These are all interjections. Wow, I didn't know that you're 30 years old. You look like you're only 21. So wow would be an interjection. Okay, now we're gonna use what you just learned. So we're gonna practice. I'm going to give you a sentence and I want you to identify the part of speech of each vocabulary word in the sentence. So you're going to read the sentence and identify the words part of speech, then choose which definition is correct. Okay, let's try this first one. Coal and natural gas are the two energy sources with the greatest percent share of electricity generation. So I want you to think, what part of speech is generation? Is this a noun? Verb, adjective, preposition, adverb. If you said noun, you're correct. Okay, now try and think which definition best fits this word based on the sentence. Remember, some words have more than one definition, so you have to think based on what they're talking about in the sentence and the context. What is the meaning here? We know it's a noun. So if you see the definitions A, B, and C, they're all nouns. So then the part of speech won't help us very much here. So you wanna think, is it A, age group, B, production, or C, percentage? If you said B, production, you're correct. Generation can mean age group, but in this sentence, it doesn't mean that. When we talk about electricity generation, we're talking about how much electricity it produces, so production. Let's try another one. We need to take care of the earth for future generations. 
So in this sentence, what is the part of speech for generations? If you said noun again, you're correct. Okay, let's try and figure out the definition. So do you think it's A, a group of people born and living around the same time, B, the process of producing something, or C, the average length of time between the birth of a person and the birth of that person's children? So for example, if you don't understand C, it means like, let's say your parents were born and then you were born. So then you'll be a generation apart from each other, about, depending on the age gap, but anywhere from 20 to 30 years. So do you think in this sentence, when we're talking about, we need to take care of the earth for future generations, is it A, B, or C? If you said A, you're correct. Let's try another one. This is the same sentence from earlier, but we're going to look at a different word. Coal and natural gas are the two energy sources with the greatest percent share of electricity generation. So we're looking at the word share. What part of speech is it? If you said noun, you're correct. You probably know that share is a verb, but here we're not using it as a verb. It's actually used as a noun. So which definition best describes it? If you see A is a noun, B is a verb, C is a verb. So we know if the part of speech in this sentence is a noun, it cannot be B or C, to tell or to divide. Those are both verbs. So then we know the only possible answer would be A, which is a noun. That means part, portion, or piece of something. So for this one, the correct answer is A. Okay, let's try another one. Since Angela's car is getting repaired, she has to share a car with her husband. So we're looking at the same word, share, but is it used the same? What's the part of speech in this sentence for share? If you said verb, you're correct. So this time, share is used as a verb. So let's try and guess the definition. So this time, it can't be A because we know it's a verb and A is a noun. So it's either B, which is a verb, to tell someone about your thoughts, feelings, opinions, etc. Or is it C, which is also a verb, to have or use something with others. If you said C, you're correct. After Pedro was fired, he looked at his boss angrily and made a hostile remark to him. Hostile here, what part of speech? Noun, verb, adjective, preposition. If you said adjective, you're correct. Okay, let's guess what hostile means. Is it A, difficult or dangerous? B, unfriendly or aggressive? Or C, of or relating to an enemy? So think about how it's used here. If you said B, you're correct. All of these are definitions for hostile, but you have to think in what way is it used. So for A, you wouldn't make a difficult remark. That's strange. And also dangerous. How is the remark dangerous? So A doesn't really make sense here. C, of or relating to an enemy, even though Pedro might feel his boss is his enemy now because he got fired. Again, here it wouldn't really make sense as well. The one that makes the most sense would be B. If we know he's angry, maybe he was really surprised that he got fired or he didn't feel it was justified, then he might give an aggressive remark toward him or a very unfriendly one. Let's practice inferring meaning from the larger context. When you don't know a word's meaning, determine the part of speech of the word, just like we were doing. Think about the meaning of the sentence. Think about the topic of the paragraph, article, or story. So whatever you're reading, think of the topic. This will help you to guess the meaning of an unknown word. So let's say you're reading about dogs. Maybe the word that you don't understand is something related to dogs. Or if it is about a virus, then it could possibly be a health term that you don't know. So whatever the text topic is, that can give you some clues. Also reading the sentence before the word and the sentence after the word can also help you. The prior sentence might give you some context that will help you guess the word that you don't know, 
and then the sentence following that might have some specific examples that will make it clear. Then infer the general meaning of the word. So infer means that you're going to guess based on all of these things. So you're going to guess based on the part of speech, the topic of the text, and then the other context clues. So once you've guessed the meaning, try to read the sentence and replace it with that new word. So if you think the new word means hate, then take out the previous word, replace it with hate, and then see if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then maybe you guessed incorrectly, and then try again. Okay, we're going to try. So this first excerpt, or part of the article, comes from Us Weekly magazine. So it's from the article called Ryan Reynolds, Blake Lively, and More Stars Make Generous Donations Amid the Coronavirus Outbreak by Meredith Nardino. So these are some famous celebrities. Celebrities are famous people. Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively are married. They're um, actors. So I'm going to show you a sentence from this article, and then I'll give you another sentence to give you some more context. Because I gave you the title of the article, this can also help you. So not only knowing the topic, but also the title of the article or title of the book can help give you some clues. During these times of uncertainty, I'm thinking about our most vulnerable populations, children who are losing access to the meals they rely on, our friends and family who are facing job disruptions, the elderly and low-income families, Ben Affleck wrote. So if you see here, I underlined and made bold vulnerable. This is the word I want you to try and guess what it means. If you don't know Ben Affleck, this is what he looks like. He's a famous actor. Okay, I'm going to give you another sentence from the article because, like I said, if we don't know a word, we want to look around the sentence. So we can look at the sentence above and the sentence below to see if there are any more clues or examples. So let me read these two sentences to try and help you some more. The Argo... Argo is a movie. So the Argo actor dedicated a thoughtful Instagram post to our most vulnerable populations on March 15th as communities began to be impacted by school closing and grocery shortages during the panic. During these times of uncertainty, I'm thinking about our most vulnerable populations, children who are losing access to the meals they rely on, our friends and family who are facing job disruptions, the elderly and low-income families, Ben Affleck wrote. So if you see actually in the sentence, which is the last sentence here, he does give you examples. So that will help you a lot in guessing what vulnerable means. So let's first think, what's the part of speech for vulnerable? So if you go back here and see vulnerable populations, populations is a noun. Vulnerable is describing the noun. So vulnerable must be a... Uh, if you said an adjective, you're correct. Vulnerable is an adjective. So what does vulnerable mean? We did have some examples of the vulnerable populations. So hopefully that helps you guess what it means. If you said easily hurt or harmed physically, mentally, or emotionally, you're correct. Vulnerable means that. This next one comes from the article, The Hard But Honest Truth About Disneyland's Closure by Robert Niles from the Orange County Register. The Orange County Register, also known as the OC Register, is a newspaper. So this excerpt, or part of the article, reads, Theme parks and other attractions all over the country are pushing back their reopening dates as it becomes apparent that COVID-19 won't blow over quickly. But rather than commit to a new date, Disney offered the industry's first honest response. It's closed until further notice. If you don't know what are theme parks, they're the same as amusement parks. Theme parks or amusement parks are like Disneyland, Universal Studios, Magic Mountain, and so on. Okay, let's look at the sentence behind it to give you some more ideas of what it's talking about. Theme parks and other attractions all over the country are pushing back their reopening dates as it becomes apparent that COVID-19 won't blow over quickly. But rather than commit to a new date, Disney offered the industry's first honest response. It's closed until further notice. The truth is that no one knows when it will be safe for large crowds of fans to gather inside theme parks again. So you may have noticed that these are actually two words, pushing back 
and blow over. They're actually not one of the parts of speech. They're something special. We call them phrasal verbs. Phrasal verbs are always two words. The first word is a verb. The second word is a preposition. So phrasal verbs are very common in the English language, and so are what we call preposition combinations, because it's a combination of a preposition with something else, like an adjective or a verb. So here, if you see push back, push is the verb, and then back is the preposition. And we saw it as pushing back. You can change the verb into any tense you want. So we can do pushing, or we could do past tense, pushed, or we could do future, will push, will push back. Blow over is another phrasal verb. So blow is a verb, and then over is a preposition. So if you were to just look up push in the dictionary and then back, they will have two completely different meanings. But when we combine it together, push back is going to have a specific meaning. So look out for these phrasal verbs when you read, also when you hear people talk. So let's look at the sentence again. Theme parks are pushing back their reopening dates as it becomes apparent, obvious, that COVID-19 won't blow over quickly. Let's guess what push back means. So do you think it's A, refuse to accept something, B, a negative or unfavorable reaction, or C, to make the time or date of something later than originally planned? So you need to remember that phrasal verbs are verbs. So they function and act like a verb. So if you look at the definitions, A, refuse, that's a verb, so that's a possible answer, a possible one that could be the definition. B, a negative or unfavorable reaction. That's a noun. So here we're not using it as a noun, so then it can't be B. C, to make. To make's a verb, so that's another possibility. So the correct definition could either be A or C. Which one do you think it is? If you said C, you're correct. If they're pushing back their reopening dates, they're going to make it later than they had originally planned. So now let's look at blow over. So do you think blow over means A, to extinguish a fire, B, to go away without serious consequences, or C, to fall down due to wind? Again, phrasal verbs act like verbs. For these three definitions, they are all verbs. So it could be any of these. Which one do you think it is? If you said B, you're correct. So in this sentence, it's actually negative. It said won't blow over. So if it won't blow over, it's not going to go away without serious consequences, sadly. We, we know COVID-19 is serious right now. And um, at the time of this recording, it is getting worse. But hopefully it will soon get better. Okay, so that's all for today. Hopefully it's clear what are the eight parts of speech and how to infer or guess the meaning based on context and a word's part of speech. So when you read, hopefully it'll be a little bit easier to understand what you are reading. You can go to my website, jessicaindevong.com, to get this PowerPoint and extra materials to study with. And if you would like to practice phrasal verbs more, check out my other videos about phrasal verbs. Okay, take care and stay healthy. See you next time. Bye.